So I'm going to turn my camera off as well so that you can see my full screen, but also because I've been told by my children that bandwidth today has been a little hanky. So I want to make sure I don't freeze or that I don't lock up. Um, and this way, my little bobbing head in the upper left hand or right hand corner doesn't distract you too much because I talk with my hands a lot. Um, so I'm going to turn off my camera and I will turn it back on when we're ready for the Q&A. Okay, so we're going to talk about tracing your house history today and we're going to cover a lot of different avenues and a lot of different topics. So I'm going to feel like I'm racing through it. So I hope you don't feel that way. Um, but I want to make sure that I leave enough time for Anne because she's going to do a case study for us that's specific, um, specific to Mount Prospect. So I want to make sure that I leave enough time for her to do that. Um, so when you begin the process of tracing your house history, there are a number of different things that you want to consider. So you want to ask yourself just a series of basic questions. And a lot of these are questions that are already going to be available to you either on your closing papers or, you know, in other documentation that you have. Like you're going to know your address already, but do you know what your legal address is? And the legal address will vary depending on where you live. If you're living in a, in a community, in a town, it might be something like the assessor subdivision or original town. It'll be a block and a lot number. If you live out towards the country, if you're in a subdivision, that legal land description might be something that includes section township range. So it might be something like section 14 of township 36, you know, east of the third prime meridian. You might get something like that. Um, so that legal description is what you're going to take as you start tracing your house backwards. Um, pin numbers are a modern phenomenon. They're really you know, mid to late 20th century. So your individual property identification number is only gonna get you back so far. Um, so you're not gonna find pin numbers in 1920 or 1900 or 1820 or 1700. They're really a 20th century product. But we need to know, we know what county we live in. We know what city we live in, but do you know what your township is? And not a lot of people do. Or if you're in an area that has road districts or other types of districts instead of a township, knowing that piece of the puzzle is going to give you an idea of where you can go to look for additional information. If you're in a modern development, you're going to know the name of your subdivision. But like I said, if you're living in town, then you might not know um, what neighborhood that might have originally been called. So I live just off of Oswego. I live in Oswego, Illinois, and I'm less than a mile from downtown and we're on a cul-de-sac. It's just us. There's no subdivision. There's just eight houses. We're called Bolton's Edition. There's no sign that tells you that that's Bolton's Edition. The only way I know it is because it's on my legal description. Um, so some people might not be aware um, of what the area or the neighborhood might be called. Um, do you know what the age of your home is? Because sometimes the age of your home could lead you um, in the right direction because certain eras have certain types of home structures. So if your home is built in the 1920s, it might potentially be a bungalow. If it's built in the 1940s, it might potentially be a Cape Cod. So the age of the home might denote the style of architecture that your house is, which can lead you in a direction as well. So if your house is built in the Queen Anne style, it's not going to be built in the early 1800s. Queen Anne is a very dedicated housing structure style um, that is indicative of a particular time period. Same thing with four squares, ranches, split levels, Cape Cods, all of those have very distinct um, eras in which they were built. So knowing the age of your home and knowing the architectural style could help you in your research as well. So those are the basic questions that you wanna start with as you're beginning to trace your house history. Now, where are you gonna look? You're gonna look at places like the circuit court, recorder of deeds. If there's a historic preservation commission or office in your area, you're gonna look there. They're usually the ones responsible for land use and um, GIS systems, mapping and things like that. Your local tax assessor is going to have information. I'll talk a little bit very briefly towards the end about universities and colleges and about libraries and historical societies. So whether you're doing research in Illinois, which is predominantly my focus tonight, 
these same types of places are going to be where you're going to look, whether you're doing research in California or New York or Virginia. They might be called something slightly different. Like in Wisconsin, you've got the registrar. In New York, you've got the probate um, office instead of the circuit court. So it just depends on where in the United States you're living as to what the technical term to the office is. But the types of records and the, the place, the, the premise of where and how you're gonna look is going to be very, very similar. So even if you're going to the registrar's office instead of the recorder's office, you're still gonna find the same types of records that are going to be there. So what types of records am I gonna look for when I go to these places? I'm gonna look for deeds and mortgages. I'm gonna look for wills and probates. I'm gonna look for personal as well as real estate tax because the personal property, the personal tax tells a story as well. We're gonna look for things like permits, building permits, renovation permits. We're gonna look for things like historic surveys or um, other types of surveys, dashboard surveys, things like that. We're gonna look at our historical societies and libraries for newspapers, city directories, atlases and gazetteers. If you're lucky enough that your community had fire insurance maps, those are really, really useful. And I'll talk about those a little bit towards the end. And then photos really are the holy grail of doing any type of house history because you might be able to find an exterior photo of a house. There might be a street scene that includes it. Interior photos of houses are extremely rare and extremely difficult to get your hands on. Um, so if you're blessed enough that somebody had the wherewithal to take um, interior photos of the house and then leave those for the next owners. Those are extremely useful in understanding how and why and changes that might've been done to the structure over the years. So now what we wanna do is we wanna follow the trail. So depending on the type of record or the location in the country where you live, um, you might have access, a deeper access to records than you do in other parts of the country. So for example, in Illinois, every county is responsible for keeping their building permits and they get to set the time period for how long they wanna keep those files. I work in Will County, Illinois, and they only keep building permits for five years. But if you're blessed, like many of you are to live in Cook County, then some of those building permits go all the way back to January of 1872 um, after the Chicago fire. So it just depends on the area of the country where you live. You just need to contact that county where you're doing your research if you're doing grandma's house and you're not doing your house and grandma lives in Ohio, then you want to contact um, the, the county in Ohio where you're doing the research to ask these types of questions. Um, and sometimes there's indexes that are built. I'll talk about that a little later on. And sometimes you're the one that's kind of slogging through the records to see what you can find. Um, but building permits can give you an idea of renovations that were done or new structures that were that were built. I mentioned briefly the local land use department, you know, the GIS, which is a geographic information system. So the people that build the maps of the city and the town. So they're the ones that do those digital maps that have the layers of where the streets are, where the water is, where the school district is. Um, sometimes those cities take the time to put together um, maps or map layers of their historic neighborhoods or their designated historical landmarks. So I always use Schaumburg Township as an example because they did an absolutely extraordinary job um, in their GIS department of building a map overlay to show the historic districts within their township. So if you're ever interested in seeing what this might look like, Schaumburg Township um, is a perfect example of that. I'll go into detail a little further about historical societies and libraries. You're taking the time to log on tonight to your local library absolutely make sure that you're contacting the library, the historical society, the genealogical society in the area where you're doing your research. Some of them have information on local architects. Some of them might have their newspapers digitized, which I'll talk about at the end. You know, some might have an, a listing of Sears homes or other kit homes in the area. Sears was not the only company that was selling kit homes in the 20s and 30s. Um, so that information could potentially be out there. And instead of you you know, recreating the wheel, there might already be something put together on that particular structure. So it's just a matter of contacting them when you get started to kind of set the tone for what you need and what can they provide. Colleges and universities are the exact same way. They have a lot of local history and that's separate from genealogy and the fact that local history is going to encompass things that affect the entire community. 
It's going to be things like city directories, phone directories, business directories, um, maps, and other publications of, of the area. So things like Sanborn maps, um, city maps, street maps, um, aerial overhead maps. Colleges and universities are a great resource for these types of visuals to help give you an idea of how did your neighborhood evolve or change? How did the structure of the home evolve or change? Um, and I'll go into more detail about city directories at the end. So like I said, properties are given a PIN number. They're gonna help you trace a specific property, but keep in mind that over the course of 50 or 70 years that PIN numbers have been around for your area, that a PIN number can be changed and it could be divided. So if you had a piece of property that was an acre and it had a PIN number, and then the property gets subdivided into two lots, now you have another PIN number, now you have two PIN numbers. And if it gets subdivided once again into quarter acres instead of half acres, then you'll have four different PIN numbers. So a PIN number can change. So don't take it as gospel that that's the only number. That's where the legal description comes in handy because it'll tell you if a property is subdivided into left half and right half or east half and west half or north half and south half. Or if it's not divided equally, it might be the north 125 feet the south 275 feet and you it'll help you start to figure out when you're looking at owners and you keep seeing the same lot and block pop up but you keep seeing different owners that legal description is going to tell you this is the east half and that's the west half or this is the north half and that's the south half um, spreadsheets come in really handy for keeping track of that but that's a you know that's something to keep in mind that that number is not etched in stone my grandma and Ellie always used to say that there are two things in life you can count on, death and taxes. So you get taxed on multiple levels. So there are multiple places where you have to go to look for this information. I'm going to talk about tax assessor records in more detail in just a couple of seconds. Um, but keep in mind that there are layers to that. Your township layer, your county layer, your state layer. So there's more than one place to look for info. And I already talked about GIS, but I had mentioned briefly aerial maps or subdivision plats, they're the places that are going to go to have the subdivision plat for the entire neighborhood, not just yours. So you can see if any changes or things have been done since the original plat was filed with the city or the county. Um, they're definitely worth talking to. And then they'll have old land and road surveys too. So if you're tracing your house back into the 19th, 18th, 17th centuries, sometimes these old land and road surveys will come in really handy. I'm going to touch on that briefly at the end. If I run out of time, remind me and I'll come back to it. So now I talked a little bit about the where and the types of records. I want to delve a little deeper. So the recorder of deeds, like I said, some places that's called the registrar in Cook County now, it's the county clerk. So it just depends on where you are in the country, but they're going to have the same types of records. So they're going to have things like deeds and mortgages. They're going to have things like land trusts, property sales and transfers. They're going to have things like sheriff sales. If somebody loses their house for failure to pay their taxes and it goes up for public auction, they're going to have those records. They're going to have those affidavits. They're going to have liens. So if somebody has their house renovated and they don't pay their bill, the, the Rental company can put a lien on the house so it can't be sold until they get their percentage, things like assignments. So there's more than just deeds and mortgages that are available at the recorder. So it's worth digging into these records a little further. Depending on where you live in the country, these records are accessible online. Um, it seems to constantly be changing and evolving. Um, Cook County now does not go back anywhere near as far as they did five years ago. Five years ago, they went back into the late 1970s. Now they only go back into the mid 1990s, which is kind of heartbreaking. Same thing with Will County. They used to go back to 1966. Now they only go back to 1996. Um, I won't make a comment about public officers, but so sometimes the information available online um, actually declines and, and doesn't improve. Um, but you still have the original records that you would have access to as well. Um, so I would start online. I would see what your, your assessor, what the recorder of deeds has available digitally that you can start from home. Um, and then if their office is open, because not everybody around the, the country is open, um, going in person and then looking through the records. If you can get back far enough, eventually you're going to go back into the original land sale when the land is purchased from the federal government. When you reach that point, 
Those records are called land patents and they're available from the National Archives in Washington, DC. You can find some of those final pages available through the Bureau of Land Management. I think I have a screenshot of one for you. I'll talk about that a little further, but eventually if you're interested, you could trace it back all the way to the very beginning. So terms that you're gonna see often, you're gonna see things like indenture, which is typically a mortgage. Um, it depends on the age and the location in the country, again, where you're doing your research. Um, but typically the term indenture is used to denote that you're paying something, um, yeah, pay, pay to own, you know, you're, you're renting to buy. Um, that could be a year, three years, five years, eight years. The owner would set the terms and the renter would then pay um, based on what the terms were set up. Deeds are the property sales between the two parties. So it's a sale outright. It could be a warranty deed, it could be a trust deed where the estate is selling something in trust. Um, those are, you know, sold or, or, you know, the money goes to the heirs of the original owner of the estate. Terms you're typically going to see is you're going to see it listed as the party of the first part and the party of the second part. You'll see that a lot, especially on indentures, where the party of the first part is setting the terms um, for the rental agreement and the mortgage E, the, the person who's renting, is the party of the second part. Um, you'll also see it listed as grantor or grantee. So in Will County, they're listed as grantor grantee in the indexes, but on the actual paperwork, when you pull the file and look at the, the deed or look at the mortgage, they're listed as grantor and grantee. So those are some terms you're just going to see pretty frequently as you're going through paperwork. You'll hear people talk about a chain of title. That's tracing the history of the ownership of a particular piece of property from the current um, buyers and the current owners back to the beginning of the property. So it, uh, those chains of titles, um, you'll see them listed as abstracts of titles. Um, sometimes you'll see them referenced as Torrens. Torrens law has changed a little bit. Um, so now if you've got a Torrens, you don't have to prove chain of title anymore because the Torrens acts as definitive evidence that the, the piece of properties is free and clear of any um, problems or issues. Um, but typically an abstract of title is something that was provided at the buyer's expense that was produced by the title company to prove that they were the rightful owners of a particular piece of paper. And that abstract of title is that chain that proves every buyer and seller from the current owner all the way back to the beginning. So they could be really insightful. They could be pretty thick too, depending on the age of a particular parcel. Um, I have one where the people who owned the piece of property were running it as a bar. They were running it as a tippling house and they owed in 1909, they owed $1,000 to Anheuser-Busch, which was a lot of money in beer in 1909. Um, and they had a lien against the property until Anheuser-Busch was paid off. Um, and that shows up in the abstract of title. So any, any type of affidavits, any types of questioning, any type of, of um, agreements or liens against the property is gonna show up in that. The problem is it's not the responsibility of the county to keep those. It was the owner's responsibility. They did it so they could prove a clean chain of title. So historical societies, libraries sometimes will have them, but you're not gonna find them typically on the county level. You have to hope that um, a copy might've been filed with the local historical or genealogical society. So I already talked about the idea of the legal description. That's where you're going to look for um, that transaction, which is going to give you section township range or lot and block in the name of the neighborhood. Um, but what's cool about them is that they, they describe clearly your boundaries. And depending on how far back you go, the boundaries could be in chains and rods, they could be in feet, they could be in yards, it depends on where you are. Um, and another neat thing about legal descriptions is I have some that are pre-revolutionary war um, in the 1760s, 1770s, that they kind of don't give a, a set boundary. They just tell you who surrounds them. So it says that, you know, you would follow the path north until you reach John McClure's farm, and then you would head south until you reach the river, and then you would head east until you reach, you know, Michael Smith's property and you would go north. So what's fun about those is it shows me who all of their neighbors are because they're written into the legal description of the property. 
So those are, those are exciting to see. So here's an example of a legal description, sort of a legal description. I'm gonna show you a, an indenture in just a second. But you can see on this map, this is Southern Cook County and Northern Will County. And actually, I apologize, this one's all Will County. But you can see that all the sections are squared out. Those are these tiny little squares. In Illinois, each section is one square mile. So if we look across, we've got six miles across and six miles down, a 36 square mile township. Most of them are square. Some of them are a little wonky based on ge you know, geography, rivers and lakes and things like that. Um, but your section, your township and your range doesn't change. So the township system in Illinois began in 1850. And by 1850, nearly all of the county boundaries were set. There were a couple of counties that were still jostling borders, but for the most part in Illinois, they were set. They were completely set by the Civil War. So if I'm looking at New Lenox and I'm looking at section three, as I'm tracing my house backwards or forwards, that house is always going to be in section three. So I know that I can automatically go to that place on the map each time. That's never going to change. So that's an important thing to keep in mind too, depending on where you live in the country, did the borders change and shift while your family was living there? And you wanna make sure you're looking at maps. I'll talk about maps in greater detail a little bit later. But in our instance here from 1850 forwards in Northern Illinois, if I'm looking at, at Manhattan Township One, it's always gonna be Manhattan Township One. It's not gonna be six, they didn't reverse it. It's always gonna be the same. So here's an example of one of those indentures. This was a, a rent to buy. Erwin and Jeanette Wright were purchasing a piece of property in the city of Joliet in what was called Ridgewood at the time, which has now been absorbed um, by the city of Joliet. But it gives me the lot description, tells me it's lot 104 in George Monroe's edition in Ridgewood, and then gives me the, the, that legal de description, southwest quarter of the northeast quarter and part of northwest quarter and southwest quarter of section 11. Township 35, range 10, east of the third principal meridian. So there's my legal description. That's what I can take to then go back to that Joliet map, look for um, section 11 and see if I can identify the property or look through city maps, neighborhood maps, specifically for George Monroe's edition and look for lot 104 listed on the map. So you have in your handout all of the local, so Chicagoland area recorder of deeds websites. Cook County obviously is at the top, but if you're doing research in, in Kane, Kendall, Will County, McHenry County, um, you're just gonna look for your recorder of deeds. I give you the Bureau of Land Management at the bottom. That was that land patent I was talking about. So when you get all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the original sale, Bureau of Land Management's where you're gonna go for that information. So now Cook County has changed. So they have just merged those offices within the course of the past year during COVID. So the recorder of deeds office and the county clerk's office have merged into one body. So Fritz is gone. You know, we now have Karen Yarborough who is responsible for both sets of records. Um, I have not been downtown to do any land research since the merger has occurred. So I don't know if they've moved offices. Um, historically, the recorder's records used to be in the basement of City Hall. You would be able to go down and look at the microfilm and microfiche of um, your property based on your, your legal land description. So maybe Ann or somebody could let me know at the end in the Q&A whether that process has changed. But for right now, you're going to a completely new website. So now you're going to the Cook County Clerk's uh, website instead of the Recorder of Deeds website, and it is one of the options. So you could see now it has vital records, it has voting, property taxes, and recording. So for us, Recorder of Deeds records, those deeds, those warranties, um, those mortgages are all under recordings. So recordings is where you're going to click um, to access that data now. So once I get there, it's not really very intuitive to how and, and why and where to search the website, um, but in the left-hand corner where it says search recordings, that's where you're gonna click to do a, a search. And there's a variety of ways to search, although they don't make it very clear. They kind of Im imply that they want you to use a PIN number, but 
if you don't know the PIN number, if you only know the address or the name, the surnames of the people involved, you want to be able to search that way as well. Um, so you can do it. It's just not easy. So like I said, it wants to default to that PIN search. But if you, if you scroll down a little and you click, um, you have the ability to search by address. So I grew up on the south side. I grew up in Bridgeport. Um, so I searched on my old address, which was 451 West 38th Street. So I grew up at the time, what was four blocks from the old Comiskey Park. Well, now the house is two blocks from the new guaranteed rate field. Um, so I was able to go in and put in my address and do a search to see what comes up. And it brings up all the property transactions from the current owners who I think have been there since 2018, you know, back to the mid nineties. The downside to that is it doesn't show me my grandparents any longer. Used to go back to 1977. You know, my, my grandparents lived there up until 1979. I have family who lived there till 1982. Unfortunately, those records aren't online anymore, but I did kind of strike gold because somehow, some way, a document wound up getting filed in my grandparents' name in the early 2000s that mentions them at that address and gives me the legal description. So um, at the very least, I was grateful to have it. I have the originals because I was able to go downtown and do it years ago, um, but that's an option for you. So I circled a couple of things because I want you to be aware that it says pin address quick search. You can put in the address. It doesn't have to be the pin. So you can search that way. If you happen to have the document because you've got a bad photocopy and it's hard to read, but you've got the number, you could type in the number or you can search by name. So I searched originally by my address on 38th Street, but I could go in and I could have searched under Middleton and seen what came up that way. And you can see underneath, there's this advanced search, this is what they call their fine grain search. So I could put more details in. I could put in the exact street address. I could put in the name. I could put in the name of the trust or the number. I could put in the document number or the year. I could sort just by year. So there's, there's more ways to search than just the pin or the name. You just have to scroll down a little bit in order to see it. And because this is the Cook County clerk's office. This is all of Cook County. This is not just the city of Chicago. So this is going to include things like Justice in Arlington Heights and in Oak Park and other places. It's not just the city of Chicago. So you're going to find information in here um, for those collar cities as well, still within Cook County. So like I said, I did a search on Middleton and it brought up my grandma Nellie. So it shows me Eleanor Middleton and you see the date on this doc. It's 12, uh, 2010. My grandmother died in 1982 and my grandpa Larry died in, in 1979. So it really caught my eye. Was this the same person? And when I clicked on it to show it, sure enough, um, it, it is my grandparents. And for whatever reason, this document was created in 1971, but for some strange reason, it wasn't filed until 2010. So even if it's a document that might've been before the dates that the county lists, it's still worth it to go in and take a look because you could still find some evidence. It could be something like a lien or a trust or something else outside of a deed that could provide some good information for you. So I talked briefly about the Bureau of Land Management. This is that, that patent that takes me back to the very beginning. You can search the Bureau of Land Management site for records for almost every state. For some really strange reason, Pennsylvania is not in here, and I don't know why, but if you're searching in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Historical Society has um, their early land patents already online through the Historical Society. Um, you just won't find them here. But I went in and I did a search. Um, I wanted to take a look at the fourth prime meridian, the things that were done after 1815 was a very specific time period, and I was able to click on that in my land description. You could search just by name. So if I was just looking for the ad sits, I'd be able to search for that. Or I could just search, you know, the, the township in general without limiting it to a range or limiting it to a section. I could search that way. And then it brings up my results. So you could see here on the right-hand side, I can sort this any way I want. I can sort it alphabetically by clicking on names. I can sort it by the date of filing. I could sort it by the township range that it's in. I could sort it by the section. So this information can be 
manipulated in a variety of different ways. But what it's going to tell you is who the first purchaser was of that piece of property from the federal government. So that could be one of your ancestors, or it could just be the original land purchaser. In Illinois, in northern Illinois, huge swaths of land, hundreds of miles, were purchased by East Coast land speculators who never set foot in the state of Illinois. Lots of people from New York and New Hampshire and Vermont who were buying, you know, 50, 75 acres or um, miles worth of land at a time. They were buying up whole sections and then subdividing them uh, out to individuals. So you'll see some people who have just hundreds of listings under their name for property that they had purchased directly from the federal government. Um, but once you click on a document and you look at a record, all it's showing you is the final page of the application. So the final play, page is going to include, it's not really the president's signature, it's you know an auto pen, so to speak. It's the land uh, officer in Illinois who's signing on their behalf. Um, but it's giving me the name of the person who purchases it, the legal description, section township range, um, and the date that it's purchased and the signature of the purchaser. But there are pages that go along before this. Bureau of Land Management only provided the final page with the signature and the certificate number, but you want the whole application. So you want to contact the National Archives to see everything else that is on that application. You'll see in the upper left-hand corner, it gives me the certificate number. There's an application number and there's a certificate number and they are not the same things. So the certificate number will eventually lead you to the application number, but they are not one and the same. So keep that in mind if you get back to a point where you're looking for the patent, that you're only seeing the final page available online. So now what about records before what's available online? That's when you have to go to the recorder of deeds or the registrar or the clerk and dig a little bit deeper. So some counties have it arranged in two ways. Some have it organized alphabetical, um, by um, the grantor and the grantee, the indexes. So I need to know who bought from whom. So for example, if I'm going backwards and I'm online and I can get back to 1977 and I know that Matt Jones bought it from James Smith or you know, however that works, then I'm gonna go to the, to the books and I'm gonna look for the grantee. So I'm gonna look for Matt Jones buying that piece of property. And then I'm going to look in the grantor book for Jones selling that piece of property. And I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until I can trace it, either forwards or backwards. Some counties actually have it set up where it's indexed by section, by township, and by range. So here in Kendall County in Oswego, I can go and pull the book for section 14 and see all of the purchasers broken down by um, section. So I can see that. Um, all of the property transactions for section two and then section three chronologically and then section four chronologically. So it's not done alphabetical by name, but it's done in chronological order. So I can see how that went back and forth. But keep in mind when you're doing that by township section, that's everybody. So if somebody subdivides and you get the Northwest quarter of the Northwest quarter, you're still gonna be on the same page as the people who are buying the Southeast quarter and the you know West half and the you know East half of you know, that same section. So sometimes, like I said, having a spreadsheet where you can put it all together helps you keep track of um, each individual parcel as it's being subdivided. But that is so much more helpful than having to do it alphabetically by buyer and then seller. Circuit court documents are really important too because there's a lot of land information that comes out of wills and probates. So not only are you going to get things like the legal land description of the property that dad lived on, but if he owned other property in other places, those have to be accounted for in, in his will or in his probate as well. So the beauty of this is if my grandpa owned property in DuPage County and he dies and they file his probate in DuPage County, if he owned land in um, Lake County, Indiana, it needs to be included in his probate in DuPage County. So if I own land in Pueblo, Colorado, I have to file that I own land in Pueblo, Colorado. My state does here in Illinois in the county where I die and where my probate is being filed. And then a copy of that needs to go to those locations. 
because they're not going to be able to sell that property unless they can prove that the ownership has changed hands, whether that's through death or through sale. So in those, in those instances where there's a courthouse fire and there aren't any land records because they were destroyed by fire, you might get lucky that that person owned property in more than one location and a copy of that probate and a copy of that sale shows up in other places. So sometimes that could be a real godsend. Sometimes if the heirs of the estate live outside of the county, they have to sign an affidavit saying that they've gotten their share of the property that gets filed in their county where they live, as well as in the county where the probate is being filed. So grandpa lives in DuPage County. I live in Kendall County. I sign off that I received my, my I sign my affidavit showing that I received my money from the estate in Kendall County. I file it in Kendall County. Kendall County has to give a copy of it to DuPage County to prove that the probate has been settled. So you can find bits and pieces in more than one location. Also, there's things like chancery and small claims court. Chancery is an equity court. It's all about fairness. So it's not always typically money, but you're going to find a lot of land disputes that show up. So anytime there's a red flag that shows up in a probate or a will, like for example, you know, in the will, dad has three boys and one daughter and the eldest son gets the home property. The second son gets, you know, the, the smaller back 40 and the other son gets a chunk of property and the daughter gets a dollar. Um, sometimes she will sue and you will find those cases in chancery or small claims court where she's, she's suing for an equal portion of the estate. So it's always worth it if you suspect that there was an unfair division of property, I'd go looking through chancery records or small claims court records as well to see if there's more information there. I talked about tax assessor records just briefly. Um, here's an example of one. This one's from Will County. So everybody has to pay their taxes based on not only the land that you own, but the structures that occupy that land. So the tax assessor gets a portion of your money based on the size and square footage of your property, as well as the size and square footage of um, the house or structures that are on it as well. So the more structures you have, the more money you pay in taxes. Um, this is done in multiple layers. Like I said, I pay money to my township. I pay money to the county. I pay money to the state. So check with the township tax assessor. Check with the county tax assessor to make sure that the information matches because it doesn't always match. I'll give you an example. Here in Oswego, there was a fire in the township tax assessor's office in 1920. So all tax records begin in 1920. Obviously, in the, at the county level, they go back to countyhood, which is 1844. Um, but on the, our township level, they start at 1920. Every house that was built before 1920 um, has a construction date of 1920 because they don't know how old the houses were because of the fire. So everybody that already had a pre-existing structure, they just put 1920. So if I go back and look at the township record, it's going to say 1920. That's not terribly helpful for me. But if I go to the county tax assessor, I'm going to get a little bit more accurate information. So always look at both because there could be discrepancies based on a variety of different reasons. I just gave you an example of why they're different here in my town. But the tax assessor is going to keep track of constructions and renovations. They're going to keep track of sales. So they're typically going to show you the last two or three sales on a property. This is the modern record that you're going to find online. This isn't the card file that they might have in the office. You want to contact them too to see if they have, if you can look through the old books or if they have an old card file that you could take a look at to see if there's more. Because the tax assessor not only has the real estate property, but historically they kept personal property records as well. So they taxed you on how many watches and clocks you had, how many carriages or wagons you own, your livestock, your cattle, your horses, your sheep. They even taxed you in Illinois on whether or not you had a dog. So you had to pay tax, but then you had to pay school tax, road tax, bridge tax, county tax, city tax. That's one thing we're good at here. Um, but those records could be really important. They might still exist in your township or in the county. They're just not online. So make sure that you're asking these types of questions. So here's an example of one. This is my house. This is the house I grew up in in Bridgeport. So the we had the only two-story structure for six city blocks when it was built in 1877. Um, so 
there's not a lot of information on the property record online, but it does tell me who the previous owners were. It does tell me how much they pay in taxes. It does give a rough age of the property. The house says it's 130 years old, which is fairly accurate. Um, if I wanted more information, I could contact the assessor's office and ask um, to see if they had any of the old documentation or things like that. So um, depending on where you live, these records might be accessible. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask. Here's an example of that personal property tax that I was talking about. This is Will County. This is Moni Township. These books were found um, and donated to Governor State University. So they digitized them and put them online. They've got about 25 years worth of these records uh, for Moni Township um, available through IdaIllinois.org. Uh, but you could see what they're taxing you on. You could see it's horses, cattle, sheep, hogs, um, your dog, um, watches, sewing machines, and it gives me the name of the person. Now, these annual tax assessments were done in two parts. The first part of the book was real estate. So it's done by section township range. So section one is gonna list everybody. Section two is gonna list everybody. And then the second half of the book is the personal property tax, which is still typically done by section, but then it's done alphabetically instead of by Northwest corner, Southwest corner. Um, so my John McDonald is listed there. He has one cow, one cattle, worth $12, you know, they had one dog um, and he was paying $5, you know, in tax on him. It was a lot of money um, back then. You can see this is 1883. So these can be really, really insightful to let you know how socially well off um, was this family. If it's your family or if it was the previous owners, you get a feel for, you know, how did the depression hit them? How did the recession hit them? You know, there were recessions in right after the Civil War, again in the 1890s, again in the 1930s. So there's been plenty of opportunity to kind of gauge um, wealth. I talked about land use and historic preservation. You definitely wanna be looking for things like those GIS maps that I talked about to look for those layers if they put together a map of historic properties. A lot of communities will do their own historic property surveys. In Will County, they did them by township. They're called Rural Structures Guides where they went and inventoried the still extant farms um, that had, you know, barns or outbuildings, you know, things that were of historical significance. Um, and then they have several urban um, core guides, like Plainfield did one for um, downtown Plainfield in order to create a, a two historic districts. Um, in Oswego, we did one. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Landmark nominations, somebody has to go out and do that chain of title research. They have to go and do the genealogy of the property. So they have to document who lived there and why this house is important. Is it important because of the architect that built it? Is it important because it's a Lincoln slept here type scenario? Is it important because the person who owned it or lived in it was historically significant in some way? Personally, I think Betty White's home that she was born in Oak Park needs to be landmarked. We can landmark Hemingway's house and we can landmark Frank Lloyd Wright homes. Why can't we landmark Betty White's house? Um, so things like that are, are how landmark nominations are important. Um, I mentioned subdivision plats and surveys already. And then roads and bridge records are important too, because like I said, the township systems created in 1850, a lot of our, our towns and cities predate that. So these road and bridge books were done um, to keep track of subscriptions. So if, if you're a local farmer and you need to be able to get your goods to the river um, to go upstream to be sold, then you're gonna be willing to pay a subscription to keep that road graded and leveled and in good condition. Um, a lot of the roads we drive on every day are named after these original families that created these roads for them to you know, navigate the prairie. Um, same thing with bridges. You know, you might have 10 families who are paying a subscription on a bridge. This is before a township tax. This is before the taxing system. So um, if you can find these, they're really, really insightful because they could pinpoint the potentially the very earliest moment when your ancestors are on that property. And a lot of people, especially out in the country, they rented farms before they bought them because they wanted to find the perfect piece of land. And that took time. So they would rent a farm for a year or two while they were looking for a piece of property to purchase. So as a renter, you're not going to show up on any document other than a mortgage, um, because a mortgage is where you're going to be renting somebody else's property um, 
but sometimes you'll find them in these road and bridge books because they're the ones that live on the street. So they're the ones that are paying um, to keep the road graded. So these are really important when you're dealing with early settlement history. So here's an example of one of those rural structures guides. It lists all of the farmsteads that they feel are important and whether they contributed to the survey or not. And then for the ones that they deemed to be historically significant, they wrote up little mini dossiers about them. So I can see in this particular um, rural structure entry that they're talking about the Steiner farmstead, shows me a picture of the house, shows me a picture of the family, shows me some of the outbuildings, but then it tells me that the Steiner family has owned the farm um, from for almost 75 years. So that's gonna save me a ton of time. I don't have to go through and try to look for a chain of title because it was in the same family all of that time. So sometimes these rural structures guides or these dashboard surveys as they're called could save you some time because they've already created that history. Now you're just gonna go back and verify and fill in the blanks. They also did a lot of these books that are called this is fill in the blank county. They were done by John Drury, not our John Drury, if you're from the Chicagoland area, not the newscaster, different John Drury. Um, but they were done for the Plain States. So they were done for Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin. I think they did one for Kansas. Um, and you can find them through a lot of university libraries have these in their collections that are available through Interlibrary Loan. And there's some libraries that have them uncirculating where you could go and take a look at it doesn't really provide a lot of information other than kind of showing you what the farm looked like between 1952 and 1957 when these books were being created. So again, like I said, photos are kind of the holy grail. So if I can get a photo of what the farmstead looked like if they lived on a farm, that could be the only photo I have of it. So these books can be important just to give you a visual clue as to what it looked like and what the surrounding area looked like. Contact your historical societies. We have two copies of the Will County book at my at the Plainfield Historical Society. So these are readily available if you look for them. What else do we have? We've got those photos and postcards. If somebody took a, a postcard photo of a street or a house, they might have it already on file in their, you know, they might have a, like the Chicago History Museum has their, their street files, their neighborhood files. So I could ask for the folder on Western Avenue and see all of the photos that they have for structures along Western Avenue. Um, they might have those county histories for the community, community histories, newspapers, phone books, city directories, all of these kind of public history things. Sometimes you're lucky enough to find architectural guides, blueprints, um, house histories that somebody has already put together. Those can be really, really important. And speaking of, Ann and I were chit-chatting right before we started uh, about blueprints and things like that. Um, sometimes you're lucky enough that you can find a historical society that has a, a, a pretty good collection of these. In the Chicagoland area, the LaGrange Public, uh, or I'm sorry, the LaGrange Historical Society has a huge collection of blueprints that they have. Um, LaGrange actually took the effort for all 95 city blocks that they have and did a dossier on each and every property, each and every house, each and every business address in that district and has file of, you know, cabinets upon file cabinets of records. So if you give them an address, they lived on 43rd Street, they're gonna pull the file for you. Some might be more robust than others. Some might have photos, some might have newspaper clippings, um, some might just have the index sheet that somebody created the, the folder for it. Um, but check with your local historical society to see if they have those. If any of you are in the Plainfield, New Jersey area, we get calls for Plainfield, New Jersey at our library at least once a week. And we have to tell them, no, it's a fabulous collection. You're right, but we're Illinois, not New Jersey. Um, Plainfield, New Jersey's public library, um, South Plainfield, New Jersey, has a huge collection of blueprints uh, for the properties within their historic districts. So some communities are really lucky that these were saved and donated and made available in a public way. I already mentioned universities and colleges and the fact that they're gonna have that public history. They're gonna have business files, community histories, photos, but in communities where there is not a genealogical society, a lot of this stuff was donated to the local university because every university has a library, and every university has an archives. Um, so I know I used to work at University of Chicago in Hyde Park and you know their business library has dozens 
of business files that were donated to them from businesses who had gone under, um, whether it's funeral homes or other livery stables, other organizations that um, donated those records. Um, if you have any family downstate in DeWitt County, um, the Clinton Public Library, the Vespasian Warner Public Library, their local history department has an enormous collection of funeral home records that were donated from several funeral homes in Clinton that were given to the historical society, to the genealogical society that are within the Vespasian Warner Public Library. So they're out there. You just have to dig around and look for them. Monmouth College um, in Western Illinois has a huge collection of business files. Um, again, it's just figuring it out, just, just turning over every rock to discover who might have some piece of that puzzle. And newspapers are essential. You're not gonna be able to do your research without going to the recorder's office at least once and without looking through old newspapers. A lot of newspapers are digitized and available online and they have searchable indexes, but that's not every newspaper. You're still gonna have to look at microfilm. You're still gonna have to look at old online indexes. You're still gonna have to look through obit indexes and things like that. But you're gonna be looking for sales, home sales, foreclosures. You're going to be looking for those annual tax assessments that are done every April. In modern times, they're done by PIN. So if you have the PIN, you can look it up that way. Historically, they were done by section township range and they were done by city block and lot. So all of the people who lived in the Bolton you know, subdivision, they'd be listed. You'd have moving days. And this is important for those people who were renting, like I talked about. You would rent your farm and you would come up, it would come up for rent between February 1st and March 1st, because you're not gonna move at the planting season or at the harvest season. So you're gonna move in winter, which was typically either Fe February 1st or March 1st. So newspaper columns are rife with moving day articles about who's moving where. Things like new construction, if there's a fire or a renovation or somebody drives a car through your living room, those things are big news and they show up in the paper. But then things like society announcements, birth announcements, wedding announcements, graduation announcements, they're all talking about where they live. You know, Susie, you know, Susie Johnson, who lives at 415 Renwick Road, you know, graduated with honors from U of I last week. Everything went into the paper. So a lot of online newspapers, you can search by address. So I could go in and search for 451 West 38th Street and see what comes up. Or I can search for Main Street because sometimes they don't always list addresses. They'll just say Main Street, Rural Route 1. Um, but you can search online newspapers that way. Here's a couple of examples for you, right? Uh, here's a moving day example for you. So you have Jay Russell is moving to the Earl Norton house. We see that Earl of Anne is moving to the Spangler house. You know, we see that E.R. Gaylord is moving to the foreign house on Lockport Street. Frank Eaton is just purchased his home. It was from the estate of um, Jeremiah Everts. So the hard part is figuring out, well, what is the Heron House? That could be a little bit more difficult, but it shows me where everybody's going. Things like fires, like you see here, not only, I kind of have a twofer here, not only do I see that the Thomas Stewart House was destroyed by fire, but that very same week, the schoolhouse on the opposite end of the township caught fire and burned to the ground as well. So now I have a date for when the, the new brick building of that school was built. It was built in March of 1913. Here's a couple of local examples. Um, Mount Prospect Herald, Arlington Heights Herald, these are online and they're digitized and they're available. Um, Newspapers.com has these papers available to you. So if you're doing research in your area, you've got the perfect avenue to get started. You can search by address, but it doesn't matter what it is it made it into the paper. I've got birth announcements where they're telling me that the, you know, the families lived at, you know, 219 North Yale. I've got a, a, a death and tells me that, you know, sympathy is extended to Beatrice and Ed Cabot who lived at 1401 Fremont. Birthday announcements, you know, I see that, you know, Sharon Conway is, you know, her address who you turned 17 on January 6th. I mean, these are amazing. I mean, just absolutely amazing for the amount of detail that they give you. This one for the Geffert-Lackner wedding, not only does it gives me 
the bride's address that the wedding took place at the home at 204 West Street, but it also tells me that the reception took place at her husband's house, at mom's house, mother-in-law's house, um, and gives me her address too. So now I know where both parties lived before they got married. Atlases and, and maps and gazetteers, um, I talked briefly about these. They're important because they're showing you over a period of time how a property or how a neighborhood or how a city changes and evolves over time. So they're important to look at them in the period where you're doing your research. Looking at a 1970 map when you're really interested in a property from 1870 won't do you any good. You need to be looking during the time period that you're researching. And the further you go back, the harder that might become. Um, but you'll stop having individual city directories and you might start having county directories because there weren't, weren't enough people in any given town to have its own book. So you're looking for a county phone book or a county directory or a gazetteer. So in Illinois, they did statewide gazetteers, 1830, 31, 33, 35, where I can see you know, when Plainfield finally shows up listed in the statewide gazetteer. And it gives me a description, tells me how many people, how many houses, how many churches which is some really good information to understand why they settled in that area. They're gonna include photos of people and houses. Early ones are going to have lithographs or illustrations of houses. They're going to include things like business owners and taxpayers. They're gonna have things like railroad timetables. So if it, you can't understand how a community died and why it no longer exists, the railroad probably closed and the town washed up after the railroad moved out or the local industry moved out because the you know, factory closed. Gazetteers and, and directories can provide all of that information for you. Here's a couple of examples of, of plats. Like I said, your section township range is never gonna change. This one's of Addison Township because it's got tiny pieces of, um, of Wooddale and, and, and Bensonville and stuff on here. So I can see Addison Township one, uh, section one, I can see who owns that property. I can see in the dark gray areas where the towns are, once it's incorporated, it no longer shows the owners, it, it grays it out. So then I could go looking for a map of Wooddale or looking for a map of Itasca to see what sections and blocks are included in that. Here's Elk Grove Township, which has Mount Prospect. Thank you, Anne and Mount Prospect, for digitizing your records and making them available through Ida, Illinois. And I'm sure Anne's going to talk about that in her little portion of her um, talk at the end here. But a great resource. Ida is fabulous, and it has all kinds of property information in it. Here's an example of how Plainfield, where I work, has changed over the years. So you can see the map of 1873 on the left. You can see there's still a lot of open space. By 1909, that's pretty well filled in. So instead of being the original town, now it's Arnold's edition, the assessor's edition, Corbin's edition, Bolton's edition, and it slowly gets chomped up into smaller and smaller pieces. But you can see those different editions in different colors. You can see the blocks. So block in the upper right-hand corner, you can see in the original town, you've got you know block one, block two, block three, block four, then you've got 9, 10, and 11, 12, 13, 14, and then the, the lots, the individual lots inside of that. So I can see how these change and get smaller as parts get sold off. And that's an important part of the story. It's always important to put your map side by side too, because township boundaries are usually just the east and west or north or north and south side of a road. So for us in Plainfield Township, 135th Street is the dividing line which is just a subdivision street at this point, but Wheatland Townships to the north, Plainfield Townships to the south. You could see the same thing with Bloomington and Addison Townships. And what's fun about these is that the map makers didn't exactly draw them to scale. They're pretty close, but they're not identical. Um, so putting them side by side can be a lot of fun to see how close they were to, to matching the scale of the other. Um, but you could very easily own property on both sides of the street. And until you put those maps together, you wouldn't make that connection, especially for people who live right on the county line. So if you're research searching your property and you know you've got family who owned property on the west side of, you know, Cook, you know, Cook Road or, or County Line Road, you want to be looking at the plat maps in the other county to match up to see if they own land on both sides. 
Here's some examples out of those county atlases. You can see some have photos, some have illustrations. Don't overlook the usefulness of road maps too. So this is a Rand McNally map from 1922. Yes, it's it's kind of a hot mess. It just looks like spaghetti strong, thrown at the wall. Um, but what's neat about this map is not only does it show me the route, it shows me the Lincoln Highway, you know, it shows me the the um, the rural routes, but it also shows me all of the post offices that no longer exist. Those rural post offices that were closed down once everything was consolidated. I can see I've got Hodum, I've got Copenhagen, I've got Wolf, I've got Normantown. These don't exist anymore. So if I have letters or envelopes or on a legal description, it says that their post office was Hodum, this map is priceless for telling me exactly where the Hodum post office was. Here's another one of those maps. This one's a little bit later, I think it's 1926, but it's telling me how far apart communities are. So I could see that Plainfield is nine miles from Joliet, that it's 14 miles to Aurora. I can see that, you know, Arlington Heights, you know, is six miles from Des Plaines. And, you know, it kind of gives you a nice visual clue as to how close or far things were. And road names change. So if I look at this map, Route 66 is listed on here, but it's also listed as, rural, as Route 4A. Well, now that's I-55. So these types of maps are really important. Um, to see how things um, change and evolve over time. Like I would question whether or not Route 19 is, is State Route 12 now. Um, I'd have to compare the two. I talked a little bit about gazetteers. These are railroad gazetteers. So it gives me an idea of how and why um, communities either exist or don't exist anymore. Um, and the one on the far left is actually the Illinois um, place names guide. There were two that were done. There was one that was done in the 90s and another one that was done in 2004. Throw away the one from 2004 because it's absolutely terrible. Um, it doesn't include anywhere near as many names as the one from the 1990s did. Um, and my community, Tamarack, where my business is named after, shows up on the 1990 one because it was a rural post office stop. It does not show up in 2004. Um, but it tells me a little bit about the community. When was the post office founded? When did it close? It tells me that it was um, closed in 1893 and reestablished in 1894 and then disbanded in 1901, which is when the community, when the rural crossroads started to decline. And then just briefly, we're familiar with city directories and telephone directories, but there's important things to keep in mind when you're researching them. It's great for tracing people, individuals at home addresses, but you also wanna use it for businesses and organizations too, because maybe you bought a defunct church or maybe you bought a building that used to be used as a fish market and it's been renovated into apartments. So we're not just looking for houses a lot of times. A lot of times we're looking for businesses and organizations as well. So you wanna look through city and phone books and directories for these types of information, these pieces. And always search multiple years before and after because people could come and go and come back again. Or family members might wind up living in the apartment or maybe the owner of record is still listed as Bob Thomas, but he's had a series of renters which are gonna show up in the city directory. Even though he's the owner, he'll show up on the deed, but then we've got five or 10 years worth of renters that might show up as well. Lots of places where you can get this information online. They're available through Ancestry. You're not looking at the digital images for Ancestry. You're looking at um, indexes. So they're showing you snippets of it. Um, Ida, Illinois, which I mentioned. Thank you once again, Anna Mount Prospect, for making the telephone directories available digitally. Um, here's an example of one of those. Internet Archive is a great place for that. Uh, Fold3 has a huge collection of mid-tier city directories. So it's gonna have things like Chicago and Milwaukee and Miami, but it's not gonna have things like Springfield and Madison and Tampa, um, but it's a, it's a great resource as well. Good thing about city directories, it'll show you if an address is renumbered. Um, so the city of Chicago, you know, renamed and renumbered their streets in 1909 and again in 1912. Um, so what used to be, um, 
Butler became normal. So I lived just off of the corner of 38th Street in normal. Um, so in 1912, Butler disappeared and normal began. Um, that's an important piece of the puzzle. If you think your family moved and they didn't, they just renamed the street. Or, you know, their address went from being 104 to being 804 Cora. That could be a big deal, especially if you're going on Google Maps or you're doing like the Google Drive by to look at a property and there's no longer a property there. You want to go through the city directories or contact the Library or Historical Society to find out, did that city rename or renumber its streets at any point in its history? County histories too are really important. You kind of have to take these with a grain of salt when it comes to the individual biographies, because you could say anything you wanted. You could literally say you were descended from the Queen of Sheba. There was nobody who was going to disagree with you. Um, so that I take with a grain of salt, but a lot of times they'll give you good property history. Yeah. Dad came from Schenectady, New York, bought this property in the northwest quarter of Section 16 and has lived there ever since. Um, but it's going to have good information about the establishment of the county, the town, the township, and it's going to give you things like those business owners and those taxpayers. So they'll tell you who the first school marm was. It'll tell you who the first livery stable owner was. It's going to tell you who the first grocer was. If that's your family, that's an important piece to that puzzle. So here's an example. This one's from the history of Cook County. It's talking about the establishment of Mount Prospect in Elk Grove. And it says that in 1850, the township was well settled and schools and churches were in every community. Um, talks about Schaumburg Township. Um, talks a little bit about, you know, who established um, various portions of the community. So these pieces of the puzzle are really important and you want to take the time to dig these out. So it tells me that Mount Prospect was a small station on the Northwestern Railway about 20 miles from Chicago. You know, as early as 1836, school was taught in the houses of the residents. That tells me when I should start looking for those um, land patents from the federal government because they're talking about people being there in 1836. Lots of places for these online. I typically will start with Internet Archive first. I'll look at Internet Archive. I'll look at Google Books. Hathi Trust has some fantastic records online. Um, but there's plenty of places to find county histories. They're available through the Library of Congress. Um, they're available through Family Search in their book collection. So they're out there and readily accessible. And most of them are OCR, so they're fully searchable. So Sanborn fire insurance maps are really important too. Sanborn is what we have in Illinois, but there could be different names based on where your location is in the country. But why these are so important is because they're giving you the, the dimensions and the parameters of the structures within the town. So if your building caught fire and you lived in a rural area, it didn't impact anybody else. But if you lived in an urban area and your building caught fire, it could take out the buildings on the entire block or it could take out the entire town. So fire insurance companies, when they sold insurance to individuals, they built these schematic maps so they could keep track of who their tenants, who the tenants were and what the structures that their buildings were, because they were going to pay out a lot more on a two-story brick structure than they were going to pay out on a one-story wooden shanty. So they needed to keep detailed maps about how many doors, how many windows, what was it made out of. You know, was the road paved or unpaved? Was there water or electricity? All of those things were an important piece of the fire puzzle. And they did these about once every decade, unless there was a disaster where they had to come in and do a new map sooner. Um, but they're really insightful. So here's an example. This is These two are from Plainfield. So in 1898, apparently Plainfield had a drug problem, because if you look at the north side of the street, you've got druggist, druggist, grocer, druggist. <laughs> there are lots of drugstores. Um, but it shows me, you know, the addresses, 593, you know, or 523, 529, 521, 520. It shows me the X's are the outbuildings. So the livery stable, the outhouses are shown on there. Each code. So if it says D2 or, or, or C1, each one of those is based on the structure and the height. So two story, the bank is a two story and it's made out of brick, you know, but these little buildings, you know, the Cooperage shed is made out of wood and it's only one story. All of that lends a piece to the puzzle. But here's the map from 1893. It took me six years. I guess I am not the sharpest tack in the pack. 
but it took me six years to realize that the entire southeast corner of Lockport Street was missing on the 1893 map. And that's because there was a fire in 1892, in the winter of 1892, that destroyed half of the block. So there's no structure there. He, they had to come back and do a new map. And then by 1898, it was redeveloped. So I can see the new structure that was built after the fire. But I can see how, th how things change or didn't change based on comparing these maps over a period of time. If somebody adds on to the back of the building, you look on the left, you look at Displane Street, they had a covered walkway to get out to the outhouse. And by 1898, that's gone. So it's no longer there. So you want to look at these and compare them and they're readily available. And the community of Evanston actually did an amazing thing where they went and made these sandboard maps available so that people could bring their houses back to what it originally looked like. Taking off additions, deciding and doing all of these things to return them back to their original structures. It, it's, it's a phenomenal project and idea. So you already have in your handout all of these places where you can go to get these state and local maps where you can find some really good information. The Chicago building permits that are done through University of Illinois Circle Campus, um, it's half of the collection. So half of it is there. The other half of it is at the Chicago History Museum. Um, these are all based on, these are based on building permits from the county. The historical societies are based on the permits that were filed through the, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, Chicago Builders Magazine, um, that was the contract, I think it's American Contractors, um, where they would put at the back all of the permits that were filed. Chicago History Museums is based on those indexes of permits, but there's two places to look for that for Cook County. Don't underestimate the usefulness of books. Grace's book is phenomenal if you're doing research in Chicago, or the Chicagoland area. Um, other great places to look, you know, Wade Hone has a good book on property research. My personal favorite is Sally Light's book. It's a little bit older, but it's still very relevant. Um, her little yellow book on tracing house histories is phenomenal. And all of these are books you should be able to get through interlibrary loan. So they should be accessible to you to be sent to your home libraries if your home library doesn't already have them. Um, other resources that you have available to the city of Chicago, city of Joliet, several cities have their own guides to how to trace your property within that particular city or district. Um, I give you the links to Chicago and Joliet to kind of give you a feel for um, the types of resources that are available to you. Um, Library of Congress, I do a whole lecture on Library of Congress resources and the HAB survey, the Historic American Building Survey, has a lot of Illinois properties listed in it. So you're probably not going to find yours in there, but it's still worth it to go in and take a look for representative styles. So if you know you have a particular architect or style, you can go in and look in the HAB survey for more information about that. You have all of those resources available to you. I am going to leave my camera off and stop sharing my screen because I want Anne to be able to do her portion about Mount Prospect resources. Um, and then I'll turn my camera on when she's done. Okay. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, thanks for your patience with going through all this material. Sorry, we have a, just a little bit more to go through. Um, this is a small, I promise, hand, kind of case study on uh, house hunting in Mount Prospect. Um, like uh, Tina said, uh, a lot of images, maps, and so forth are on Ida, Illinois, uh, related to Mount Prospect in the area history. This uh, is a postcard from 1909 in Mount Prospect. This is Emerson Street. So you can see how much has changed in Mount Prospect since that time. There are just a few houses at that point. It was mostly rural. I think this is facing north on Emerson Street. So um, I'm not sure. I think it's probably from Central Avenue, but these houses don't exist anymore. Uh, Mount Prospect has been through a lot of change and it continues to go. So when I, I have done a lot of house histories for the Historical Society and their house walk, that uh, kind of got me through it. And I have been downtown to search the Torrens records, which is called the records in Cook County called Torrens with Dean Murphy, who's our um, local uh, historian of Mount Prospect. And she kind of walked me through that process. But when I get a house, 
somebody asked me about researching a house, I go to the Cook County property tax portal. I'm not gonna take you to the actual website, but here is a link. Um, and use the address as a search term and note property tax number. Um, most of Mount Prospect houses are post, uh, I would say 1920s on. So um, we don't have a lot of really old houses left in Mount Prospect, um, a lot of teardowns and so forth. Um, but when you can, uh, you can look through any kind of research papers you have at home for clues about the property and talk to the neighbors who live in the neighborhood for a while. Uh, they can give you clues about who has lived there. Um, once you do go through the property tax portal, like um, Tina said, the records only go up to like 1990, maybe 1980s. Um, you do have to go downtown. But when you find the property uh, description, that legal description that Tina mentioned, you'll be able to have the information to be able to go downtown and do that with the help of clerks there. Um, I would then look at the Historical Society's website to see if, the, if this particular, your particular home has already been researched for the house walk or if there's other files available on that house. You can also look up, as Tina mentioned, um, any address or subdivision names in newspapers. We have access to newspaper archive and newspapers.com, which have the Herald. Um, you can also try the Historical Chicago Tribune and Chronicling America. Um, it helps to look in a lot of different places, as Tina noted. And then you can look up the names that you find when you find the address, um, any articles you find in the telephone directories. And we have those in the, in the library. Um, I, the case study I did was 619 South Lewis. This is, I looked it up by address in the property tax portal of Cook County. This tax portal kind of combines a lot of information from the assessors and from and the clerk and so forth. It's kind of one stop place. So there's a lot of information here. You can get more property description characteristic information if you clicked here. What I did was went down the page and you can look click on more record information and that'll take you to the document to the clerk clerk's office where the 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 recorder of deeds information is now. Um, it's merged with the clerk's office and click on search recordings. This is a different way from um, the search Tina did. I find this a little bit more direct. Um, there's two, you can look by the pin number or the uh, address. I have the pin number, so I use the pin number and option. And then this is what I came up with for this particular property. There's a listing of trust and deeds and mortgages and so forth, a lot of the back and forth, but it mentions names. And sometimes these are names, you can use these names to look in the newspaper to find more information. Um, I clicked on one of those uh, trust or deeds and you can look at the image of the record and I snipped the legal description of the property. Um, this is what is interesting. This is, you know, as Tina mentioned, very detailed listing. But what I pointed out is Plesson Heights is the subdivision and Uller King was division of land. He was the original land. A lot of the land around Mount Prospect was um, farms. And like starting in the 20s, a lot of farms were divided and into different subdivisions. And one of those was Plesson Heights. So I use those search um, to get an idea of, of what, where we're talking about in Mount Prospect. This is a 1951 map, which was pre uh, prepared by a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this was when Mount Prospect was really starting to boom in the 1950s. So around the circle area is where 619 South Lewis is. Um, you can tell it's very different from current day map, but it was like right on the edge of town. And talk about name changes. Boundary Road is now what we know as Kensington. Um, so I looked in the newspapers for the subdivision name, to kind of get a history of the of the area, and I found the public notice for when the Pleasant Heights was um, uh, created. And that was in 1930. Nothing happened um, until the 1950s because we had the Depression and World War II. And then after that, the big boom happened. 
these were ads for Pleasant Heights, encouraging people to purchase. They do mention the Kulik Construction Company, which made some of the houses in that area. Um, when I searched by address in the newspapers, we came up with these articles, and I got some names of the people who lived in the house, you know, early on. The earliest one I found was 1961. He was uh, John Addison. There was a theft of a piggy bank, $90. That's a lot of money for a piggy bank. And then I found just a small snippet of a uh, Dorothy Donna, who was the last name listed on the list from the um, the Cook County, uh, record, the recordings, now it's in 1972. So it gives you a range of the people who lived in this house. I next looked up the, uh, the names in the, our city directory. This is the 1965-66 directory. It's not digitized yet. We do have the hard copy in the library. Just really interesting in that period, how much information they give about this person, his wife, his children, and what he did in his telephone number. And then Hoffman, um, different spelling, but I did find him again, but not much information about him. Wasn't able to find much information about him um, elsewhere either. And this was 1969. And you know, the more familiar form of the, of the telephone number. Um, my suggestion next would be uh, check with the historical society. Um, they are, um, they do have an online list of houses that are in their files that research has been done on, but they also have subdivision and neighborhood files and a number of maps, probably including flat maps. Um, Emily DeTillo is the executive director. I give her email address. Um, there are a number of files and records in the collection of the historical society and um, there's always continually to work on making them accessible to people, and that can take time. And if you want, I'm more than welcome to schedule a reference appointment with me to discuss your search. Um, my email is there, phone number, come in person. And uh, so that's what I have. That's a quick search of a Mount Prospect house. <laughs> so now we can take questions. Um, you ready, Tina? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Go that, was back. Fan that was fantastic. Thank oh, you for thanks. sharing that. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, let's go back. Oh, there was a couple of comments. Um, let's see. That I thought were interesting. One woman was saying her house was 1905 appears in two counties because the land was originally in a large county. So that would be... Um, a challenge. Um, and then another person said, um, she, her house was built in 1926. She wanted to try, or he wanted to find original plans and changes. Um, it's in Cook County, suburban. I'm not sure the records for that far back were available. I guess it would depend on the town that it's in. And, um, but I'm not sure if she's still on the call. On the, in the meeting, but um, I would encourage them to find the name of the town and maybe you can see what's available locally. I, um, I, would, I would check the, the Chicago History Museum to see if it shows up in that contractor okay. index. Okay. That would that'd probably be where I'd look for it first. And then newspapers, um, yeah. either by address, address or by the architect to see, but plans right. are tough. They, they really are. But I would also check to see if it was a kid home too. Um, if there's any indication, you know, if it looks like every other house on the block, um, I would check to see, Internet Archive has a fantastic collection of um, their catalog collection. Actually, while, while we're, we're talking, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Um, but they, um, they did like Sears Homes and other kid homes where they put, they digitized the copies of the original brochures and magazines. So you could see the, uh, what the exact layout was supposed to look like. Hi. It tells you how many linear feet of wood you were supposed to buy and how many sheets of drywall you were supposed to buy and everything. They're fantastic. They have another uh, person was saying he has a house built in 1963 in That's Mount Prospect. Certainly. And um, he wanted the blueprints, uh, 
the historical society and the library does not have them. I know it's the builder. Uh, right. I was helping this patron and um, I did track, pardon? I did track down also the name of an architect, but I couldn't find anything more with the builder. I didn't know if you had any suggestions. That could be that, that's yeah that's the top yeah, tough part about it i'm going to put in the chat that um the american builder magazine um, okay which at the end of it they always had the the yeah, new construction that was going on those are digitized in internet archive but they're not they're not indexed as one they're indexed as individual issues so you kind of have to have an idea and kind of work through them that way Okay. Um, but I also want to put in here the. Uh, I also want to put the catalogs in here too. For you. If I can okay. find it. Give me just there. This catalog. So the uh, American Girl would be a good one. They said bone marrow biopsy. Um, there's somebody that's coming. I need to mute. Um. Um, and, so I just put uh, those both in there for you. Okay, I, I would you. take a look at those. Um, yeah, plans are tough, um, just simply because the, as I was telling Ann earlier, we were talking about this, they, there are multiple people who had them. So the, the builder had one, the architect had one, the owners had one, and sometimes they would file a copy with, um, they file a copy with the county in order to get their permit or it with the tax assessor in order um, for the changes to the structure. Um, but it's just a matter of whether or not they, they still existed. If somebody had the wherewithal to say, this is important and let's keep it. And they donated it to the library or to the historical society. Um, that would be the places where I would check. Uh, another good place to check. Um, are you guys familiar with using... Um, Bye. I just drew a blank on what it's called. Uh, the, the archives, um, archive grid. If you're familiar with using archive grid, that is, so there's WorldCat for books that you would find in libraries across the US. Archive grid is designed to allow you to look for manuscripts collections. Um, so if you know um, who the, the architect is, you could potentially look up the architect and see where in the United States his collections or copies of his plans or you know information about him might exist personal letters business letters those kind of things um, same thing would be for the individuals too so you know we might not think that our family is important enough to wind up in an archive somewhere but you know their personal letters and correspondences to friends and family all over the world could be hiding in these little nooks and crannies that you didn't even know existed because you hadn't thought to to look for them um, so I would I would poke around. I here's the link for Archive Grid. So okay. I mean, you could even do a search on architectural plans and narrow it by, you know, Mount Prospect or whatever it happens to be. Okay. So here's the catalogs first. Here's Archive Grid, um, but it basically works like a library catalog, but for manuscripts and documents. So okay. there's the potential there that you might be able to find something about the architect or plans. I would go through things like Architectural Digest and things like that because they put out annuals every year, kind of like city directories or phone books by profession. So it's very possible that if, if you could discover through a newspaper who the architect is, you might find him in one of these annuals and there might be mentioned that, oh, he retired to San Francisco. Well, then I'm going to be poking around to every architectural collection, museum, university in the area to see if they have any of these these plans this guy's body of work i know it's a lot of digging but I, it could potentially be worth it okay um do did sanborn maps include farms no no as i had said they were only doing incorporated areas because if a farm caught fire it didn't impact anything else. So they would have bought their own insurance, but there wouldn't have been maps. They wouldn't have created Sanborn maps or other fire insurance company maps for these. So in our area, the, the farm insurance would have been McWethy Brothers. Um, and I have some copies of their policies, but they didn't create maps. They only created maps for incorporated areas. So you'll see a town change over time because the town gets bigger because they incorporate more area. So you'll see Mount Prospect change and grow in size from like one page maps to eight page maps over the years. 
um, but they were only drawing maps for incorporated areas. So even if it, if a portion of town was built and established, but it wasn't incorporated yet, it's not going to show up on a Sanborn map. Um, the uh, Sanborn maps available digitally, they are with a special subscription and some libraries have them, we do not. Um, yeah, we don't I think Arlington anymore. Heights ha might have a collection if you wanted to go there. Um, what I would do is I would reach out to your local LDS center. I know yeah, many of our um, libraries are affiliates, but Latter the LDS mm -hmm. might have a subscription to uh, ProQuest oh, okay. the, Historic Map yeah, Works. The, the libraries, yeah, and the history library. Um, and uh, one attendee said that the Chicago building permits address was wrong. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's HTTPS um, colon slash slash research guides dot UIC dot EDU slash CBP. Thank you so much for the correct link. I appreciate that. Okay. I'm bookmarking it now. And um, we have someone who wants the plat maps for from 1900 to 1950 for Palatine and Elk Grove townships. Um, you know, I think that we the historical society might have them, but again, it's going to take some digging. We have some plat maps at the library. I'm not sure what um, we would have it have to go through and verify that. Um, the Cook County is the assessor's office. Um, Elk Grove Township. Um, sometimes they're they're hard to find, um, but um, we just kind of have to keep looking. If you want to um, look digitally online, I would look at Arfax, A R P H A X. Um, they usually have the plat map books available for purchase. Um, like at our library, we have the ones for Will County, and. In the early years, they're sporadic. They did 1870, they did 1860, 62, 73, 93, 1909. And then there's not another one until 1922. And then in the 30s, they started doing them yearly. So we have the, the spiral bound maps. They're terrible Xerox, black and white copies. They're awful. Um, but we have them, you know, from the, the late 30s, early 40s up to the 2000s, um, you're just going to have to reach out to those communities and find out if they're there. Um, but our faxes is a place where you can go if you wanted if you wanted to purchase copies of them. But because these are modern, technically modern records, they're still within copyright. So they're not typically things that you're going to find digitized online after 1924 because of that copyright, um, because of the copyright law. So you're going to have to contact organizations and you can go in. I mentioned WorldCat already. So you can go into WorldCat and do a search for Cook County Platt and just see what years pop up. And it's going to show you every library that has it. Doesn't mean that they'll all lend. Probably very few of them will lend because they're typically reference, um, reference material. Um, but you can at least see who's close to you that has copies of it. If that makes, hopefully that makes sense. Um, another question is how far back do the online Chicago and Oak Park land records go? Um, do they have records from houses and office buildings from 1850 to 1900? You're talking about the recorder of deeds? The recorder of deeds for Cook County only goes back to the 1990s. Um, now, if you lived in McHenry County or Lake County or, or a couple of other, or Kane County, they go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, they're fantastic online, but you have to consider the volume of transactions taking place in Cook County. So if you're looking for the, mm -hmm. the digitized land records, you're not gonna find them online. Um, but in Oak Park, so how many of you have ever used the CCC, the Chicago Collections Consortium? Have any of you ever gone to the I've heard of it. I website? haven't used it that often. So let me put it in the chat if I spell collections okay. right. ChicagoCollections.org. Um, this should be, with my fat fingers, Hope, hopefully I typed that correctly. Let me check. No, because I have terrible fingers. Um, ChicagoCollections.org, I just mistyped it when I typed it in the chat, I apologize. Um, but ChicagoCollections.org, um, 
under their resources, if you go there, they've got a lot of community resources that break down some really fantastic stuff. They have a huge collection of um, social services and things like the Committee of the 15, and, and like I won't get into details about that, but they have a lot of neighborhood collections that are in here. And I believe Oak Park is one of those that is listed. Um, so at the top, if you click on Explore Collections, and if you scroll down under Neighborhoods, so we've got Pilsen, Near Northside, Bridgeport, Pullman, The Loop. Oh, they've got a lot more than they had originally. So um, they've got things like Old Town, Hermosa, Bronzeville. I mean, they've got a lot of information in here, but Oak Park is listed under Cities. Winneka, Oak Park, Evanston, Lake Forest, Des Plaines. Um, and under Oak Park, they've got, a, a, if I remember correctly, a huge collection of plans listed. Um, all kinds of photos. Um, th there's some really fantastic stuff. So the Chicago Collections Consortium is based up, up of university archives, museums, and library collections. So it's things like the Art Institute's Ryerson Collection of Architecture. They've got things like the Bronzeville Historical Society, um, Black Metropolis, um, U of, U, UIC, U of I, um, Loyola, Chicago Public Libraries, Municipal Archives. There's a lot of stuff in this collection. Um, so I would definitely start to go through it and look for your neighborhood or just kind of do some keyword searching to see if there's going to be um, that information in there. But I remember specifically seeing blueprints as one of the options. Mm. Um, just trying to remember, because it wasn't the city I was doing research on at the time, but I'm pretty sure it was Oak Park specifically. Um, but the Chicago Collections Consortium is phenomenal. So all of us should be using it, not just for architecture. There's some great um, social history, settlement history. Um, the Chicago Teachers Union uh, for Chicago uh, Public Schools, their records collection is in here. Um, it's not all digitized, but at least gives you call numbers to where you can go. Um, Century of Progress, all kinds of stuff is in this collection. It's amazing. Um, but the problem we have with Chicago is there's so much. There are so many places. Yes. Like you should absolutely be using the Chicago Public Library's collections, the municipal collection, the archival collection, um, the genealogy collection that Harold Washington Library has, and a lot of branches. Um, is it the Woodruff Library has, you know, a, a huge collection of African American history and artifacts. So, I mean, not just the not just the main library, but all the branches have important collections too, just like um, North Center. Um, Julie's collection up um, in, in, in North Center. So, um, I mean, th there's just some great stuff there. There's the universities, you know, so you wanna check and see what UIC has, what, you know, um, Northwestern has, what DePaul has. You wanna see what, um, you know, University of Chicago has. That's where looking at Chicago Collections Consortium, looking at Ida, Illinois, because like the Newberry Library has collections in Ida, Illinois. Um, you wanna look at things like um, Archive Grade and WorldCat to see um, what they've got also. So I, that that's the problem we have with living in or, or around Chicago is there's so many resources and places to look. Well, thank you so much, Tina. I think we all have a lot of work to, to, uh, to look forward to. Um, and, uh, oh, it looks like uh, somebody looked on a um, Kane County Recorder website and found an 1892 heirs flat map for my relatives with the heirs listed. So, yay. Kane County's amazing. Um, Kane County's and, records and uh, Lake County's records are amazing. Yeah. And somebody found a pamphlet about a family home that would be declared a historic building by the city of Chicago. At the, so people have found really interesting stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the a link to the um, evaluation form. And um, I'll send it off also with an email. And I'll send a copy of the a link to the recording when it's available. Thank you so much, Tina. 
It's a lot of information. I really appreciate you doing this. And thank you all for joining us and sticking with it. Um, I wish you all good luck on your search and feel free to contact me if you want some, um, some guidance. So everybody have a good night. Thanks, Thank Anne. So Thanks, much. everybody. Stay warm, stay safe.